Okay, so last time we talked about dominant and recessive alleles, and we got into genotypes. And now we were starting to talk about phenotypes, and we went over, whoops, we went over uh, cystic fibrosis last time. And we found that it is a recessive trait, meaning that if you are homozygous dominant or heterozygous, you do not have cystic fibrosis, but if you are homozygous recessive, then you do have cystic fibrosis. So sickle cell anemia. This is our next one I wanted to go over with you guys. Now, erythrocytes, these are red blood cells. These are uh, blood cells that carry oxygen. You also have different kinds of blood cells, guys. We have white blood cells, which help uh, fight infection. And then we also have thrombocytes, which is in our blood. Uh, platelets is another term for them. They clot our blood, but let's focus on the erythrocytes. Like I said, they carry oxygen. Now, if you look, they kind of have uh, like a donut shape to them. And some of them aren't a full donut. These are called sickle cells. Now, you either have sickle cells or you do not have sickle cells. There's no like, you know, oh, some person is, is, has normal blood cells and all of a sudden they turn sickle. No, it's not work like that. This is a disease that you have from birth. And I've had students in the past that have actually had sickle cell anemia. And the sickle cells don't have as much surface area as our normal erythrocytes, as our normal red blood cells. So with these sickled cells, since they don't have as much surface area, they can't carry as much oxygen as our normal cells. So let's go over what we need oxygen for. If you remember from our chapter seven with cellular respiration, our bodies need oxygen for the electron transport chain in order to make ATP. So less oxygen, less ATP, less ATP, less energy, right? So people with sickle cell anemia, they're not gonna get as much oxygen to where it needs to go. Whenever my students would have a sickle cell, I guess we can call it a flare up, because sometimes they're, they're fine. And every, other times their sickle cells, they, they become more plentiful and all of a sudden they just don't have energy. But they would miss days at a time because they wouldn't have enough energy in their bodies. So there was a famous dealer back in the day named Ryan Clark and he's number, yeah, he's number 24 there. But anyway, um, or I'm sorry, he's the guy that comes in at the end here. Yeah, right there, that's Ryan Clark. Um, but anyway, so Ryan Clark had sickle cell anemia. So when the Pittsburgh Steelers played the Denver Broncos, Ryan Clark would not go. Reason being is Denver is very high in altitude and the oxygen is not as plentiful up there. So Ryan Clark with the sickle cell anemia wouldn't be able to get a whole lot of oxygen uh, to his body and he just, he couldn't play in Denver. So sickle cell anemia once again is a recessive condition. If you are big R, big R, you're fine. You have normal red blood cells. If you are big R, little R, your red blood cells are fine as well because the big R dominates the little R. But if you are homozygous recessive or little R, little R, you have sickle cell anemia. It is on chromosome number 11 where this trait is carried. You don't have to know these examples, guys. You don't have to know the chromosomes. I'm just trying to give you some examples. Now, right now, we went over cystic fibrosis. We went over sickle cell anemia. And then they were both recessive conditions. Dwarfism, actually a dominant condition, which is kind of strange, right? Um, you're like, okay, there's not a whole lot of uh, people of this stature in the world. Why is it dominant? Isn't dominant more prevalent? Well, no, not always. If there's a whole lot of recessive alleles in a gene pool, the recessive is gonna be more prevalent. So if you guys have ever seen this show, um, Little People, Big World, there was a mom and a pa, and they actually had kids that were of um, a regular height. So how was this possible? Well, they, Again, it's dominant. 
So if they are big R, big R, they have dwarfism. If they're big R, little r, they have dwarfism. But if they are little r, little r, they're of normal stature. So both of these parents had to be heterozygous because both of these parents gave that little uh, allele, okay, or that recessive allele to the son that, you know, and the daughter that are of normal stature, okay? So two people with dwarfism, yeah, they, they can have a um, person of average height. And that's on chromosome number four. This one here, if you guys see the dimples there, having dimples is dominant, all right? That's on chromosome number 16. Freckers, <laughs> if you have freckles, that's dominant, all right? What is going on here? Oh my goodness. Person has six fingers and six toes. This is called polydactyly. Polydactyly. Uh, it's having six fingers or six toes, and yeah, that's actually dominant as well, which is crazy. So usually, guys, it's a little stub, but it's usually not as big as this person's here. But yeah, and that's on chromosome number seven. Uh, Disney. Uh, having brown hair is dominant to blonde. Now, there's a lot of other things. If we want to go over black hair and red hair, um, there's different alleles and different traits and different chromosomes involved with that. It's actually like multiple chromosomes that influence hair color. But for this one here, brown hair is always uh, going to be dominant to blonde. And that's on chromosome 16. All right. So... Let's move on with all of our other stuff here. So what Mendel did was he began studying each characteristics and whatever trait was different. So he started growing plants that were true breeding. Let me just go over the flower color with you guys as an example. So what he started doing was taking, uh, there was purple and white flowers. Purple was dominant to white. He started taking purple flowers and breeding them, and he saw that their offspring only produced purple flowers. That's a true breeding one. If you were to self-pollinate this uh, purple flowered plant, it's only going to produce purple. That's it. You're never going to see a white in there. He also took white ones and kept pollinating them and saw that, hey, okay, this one was only producing white ones. So the purple true breeding ones, what we mean by true breeding, guys, is it's probably going to be homozygous. So uh, purple is going to be homozygous dominant if it's true breeding. And white is going to be homozygous recessive, which is the only phenotype or the only genotype for white. Okay. So he used a lot, like I said, guys, he just kept doing these different things with the uh, pea plants. Now, his first ones that were true breeding, meaning the purple flowered ones was, were big, big, uh, and the white flowers ones were little, little for the alleles. He got two of these and he crossed them. He called these the pea generation. When he did that, when he cross-pollinated the purple true breeding flower with the white true breeding flower, he got all purple flowers. And he called that the F1 generation. After this, he took the one F1 generation and he crossed two of those F1 generation flowers together. And then he got the F2 generation. When he did the F2 generation, he found that even though both parents were had purple flowers, out of almost a thousand, yeah, he he had some like serious time on his hands, guys. He counted a thousand flowers that were or that were made as offspring from the purple flowers in the F1 generation, and he found that in the offspring, about three quarters of them were purple, just like the parents, but one quarter of them was white. So that white uh, phenotype reappeared in the F2 generation. He found that it was almost a three to one ratio. All right, so it was like for every three purple ones, we got one white one. 
So as Mendel went through his P generation, his F1 generation, and his F2, he didn't know at the time, guys, which one, which one of our two traits uh, or our alleles was dominant or recessive. So in the F1 generation, one of the parents' phenotypes disappeared. Then, once the F1 generation was crossed, whatever that trait was that disappeared, it reappeared later on. That one that reappeared and disappeared, that was his recessive allele, okay? And this is everything we just went over. So in this one, the purple was dominant and the white was recessive, okay? So during Mendel, uh, this whole thing with his um, traits, he found that each one of the flowers received one factor from the parents, just because one disappeared and then it reappeared. Okay. So what he concluded was there was something called the law of segregation. And what this meant was that as these alleles are um, present in the cells, and being put into the gametes, into the sex cells, whether it's the sperm or the egg, um, what's happening is they're separating, and it's very random as to which one it's going to go in, uh, which cell it's gonna go in. He also found there was something else called the law of independent assortment, meaning you guys know at the endomeiosis we form four cells. Each one of these cells is going to receive a different allele. It doesn't matter which one it goes in. It might go in cell one, cell two, cell three, cell four. Uh, as long as each one of these cells gets an allele, it doesn't matter the order to which one. It's not like, okay, we got uh, three purples and one white allele. We don't have to do purple, 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 white. We could do like white, purple, 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 or purple, purple, white, purple. It doesn't matter what the order is. It's very random, in other words, okay? So here's kind of like some different combinations here that we can do. The combinations can be completely different, right? And we already talked about this one, guys. Uh, for our chromosomes, here is the purple flower area. It's called a locus. Uh, so that is just a location on a chromosome where a particular trait is located. For the purple flowers, it's going to be in the same location on both of our chromosomes. No matter if it's dominant or recessive, it does not matter. Okay, we could skip that one. We're good there. Okay, and we already talked about this one, guys. During meiosis, gametes receive an allele from each parent for a particular trait. So you're only going to get one allele from... Uh, each parent. No, no, no parent should give you two alleles and the other parent give you one because that means they gave you too many chromosomes. You only get, want to get one chromosome from each parent and each of those chromosomes is going to have one allele for any particular trait. So now we're going to go through a little bit of Punnett squares. I know you guys probably like these. These are pretty easy. Before we get into Punnett squares, I'm gonna go over just, and this is easy math for you guys. You should have learned this in eh, fifth or sixth grade. Um, probability, We're, we are gonna be doing some probability here. It's whatever you're trying to conclude, whatever the problem's asking you, you're gonna take that number and divide it by your total number of events. So in this first one, in Mendel's experiment, he counted the color of pea pods and found 6,000 uh, and 22 pea pods were green and 2,001 were yellow. And what is the probability that the dominant trait will appear in a similar cross? Okay, so here's what we're going to do. The dominant trait for this one is going to be our green. So we're going to, for probability, we're going to do green over our total. So how many green ones do we have? 6,022. And we're gonna divide that by our total, which is 6,022. 
plus 2001. So when we do the addition part of it, we get 8,023. And then we would do 6022 divided by that number and we get 0.75. If you guys wanted to do a percent, now this is, the fr this is called a frequency here. If you want to do the percent, we would times it by 100 and we would get 75%, okay? Okay, so we're good there. I just did it instead of going through all this, guys. Okay. Um, we're talking about height in this one. 787 were tall, 277 were short. How many would be recessive? All right, so we're gonna do, whoops. We're gonna do pretty much the same thing, guys. Nothing too crazy here. We're going to try to figure out our recessive, so that's 277 divided by whatever our total is. So we would take uh, 787 plus 277. We get 1,064. Divide the two, and we get roughly 0.26, or if we wanted to times it by 100, we could do 26%, okay? So that's all to do probability, and that just should be a refresher for you guys from um, grade school. Okay, so we know that Mendel worked with seven different characteristics of our pea plants. We are only going to work with one at a time. We do not want to try to tackle all seven of them at the same time. So if we're only doing one at a time, it's called a monohybrid cross. Mono means one, so we're only worrying about one trait at one time. And we're going to use our Punnett squares to determine all this. So flower color is passed on through complete dominance. If you notice, I'm starting to use some terms here, complete dominance. What this means is complete dominance is complete dominance is our normal inheritance. Complete dominance tells us that we are going to have big R, big R be dominant, big R, little r be the dominant uh, phenotype again, but little r, little r is going to show us the recessive phenotype. So purple flowers are dominant to white. So that tells us, and I'm just going to use R because I like using R. Um, I hate using weird ones, guys, like uh, C, please don't use C, or S. Reason being is C, capital, and C, lowercase. If you don't differentiate them well, if you say, oh, that second one's a lowercase, you're going to get confused. Try to use letters where the capital looks completely different than the lowercase. It just makes your life a lot easier. Keeps you organized as well. So big R, little r, as long as it has one dominant allele, it's going to be that dominant phenotype. So that's going to be purple, purple, and white. So it says cross a heterozygous dominant flower with a homozygous recessive flower. So what we're going to do here is on top of our Punnett square, we're going to put our homozygous dominant one. All right. On the other side, I'm going to use a different color for it, we are going to put our homozygous recessive flower. And then we're going to fill in our Punnett square. Okay. Now, if you have it where there are dominant and recessive alleles in there, you always want to make sure you are putting your dominant allele first and your recessive allele last. So I'm going to carry over the recessive allele first. So these boxes here, we're going to go straight over that way. So we're going to take this lowercase r, put it in that box, put it in that box. This lowercase r, we can go in that box, that box. Capital R's, we're going to bring these down because they're on top. Same thing with this one. Okay, and it doesn't matter, guys. I put the homozygous dominant on top. You could have put it on the side if you wanted to. You would have got the same answer. But if you look here, all of our four offspring, so we have one, two, three, four offspring choices, all are heterozygous. So we get four that are heterozygous in that. And here's the, I did all this guys, but 
we ain't got to do all that. So when we are doing our punnett squares, we're going to have genotypic and phenotypic ratios. And I'm going to wait till tomorrow to uh, do some examples with this, guys, because they can get a little bit lengthier. But just to kind of give you a prelude to it, genotypic ratios are going to be dealing with the alleles. The phenotypic ratios are going to deal with what we are going to see uh, in the offspring with our um, punnett square cross. So we'll tackle that tomorrow, guys. Have a good rest of your day, and I'll see you next time.